What's up, y'all? I'm KM Best coming to you full screen instead of in my normal little box to talk about the best decks in Marvel Snap. I don't think any discussion of the metagame would be complete without starting here. And this is my current build of the Darkhawk list. It's very similar to Browday's build of the Darkhawk lists, but this is level one of the metagame. You need to be prepared for this deck if you want to play on ladder, if you want to play in Conquest. You need to respect that this deck exists and that it is a real thing that can actually beat you. So in order to respect that, my list, of course, is running Rogue and Cosmo. Cosmo stops their Shang-Chi's from killing you. Rogue is obviously unbelievable in a matchup against another Darkhawk and is also just pretty good elsewhere. This is just the baseline good list. It is solid into a lot of things, but also... At this point, there are going to be a lot of people who are prepared for it. So this list is good. There is nothing wrong with running it. It is just sort of generically quite strong, able to disrupt your opponent quite well. And at this point, the entire meta, to me, sort of revolves around beating this. And the main method of beating this is by making sure that the cards like Enchantress, or in our case Rogue, and Shang-Chi are not actually going to be doing much in the matchup. So one way to do this is by staying below 9 power and not running any real ongoings, blanking draws in a game where there are only 6 turns and there are only so many cards that you're going to actually see is very, very powerful. This deck knows that. It does a lot to blank its opponent's draws, Rock Slide and Core. So basically, this is the baseline of the meta. A lot of other things are being built with this in mind. Speaking of those things that are built with that matchup in mind, we have my build of the move tempo deck, which is what I'm tentatively calling it. Basically what's happening here is we're trying to get a bunch of stats on the board using the move core with Silk, Miles Morales, Craven, and others. And we're using Kitty Pride to juice our Angela, to move our Silk around the board, and generally just playing a synergistic deck full of very powerful cards that don't exceed 8 power for the most part, and therefore blanking anyone who wants to run Shang-Chi, Enchantress, Rogue. Those cards don't matter versus us as long as we play correctly. So this is the sort of more aggressive version of the build, but there are several decks that are using this sort of core package that you're going to see in this video, so don't by any means take this one as gospel. Uh, cards I have been impressed with in this list include Jean Grey, definitely something that you want to check out there. Armor, if you're worried about Nimrod decks, or even your own Enchantress, if that is the kind of thing that you are running into and those are the kind of issues that you are having. There's a lot of room for flexibility here. I would suspect that Chavez is a little bit of a flex slot. Nightcrawler is definitely a flex slot, so feel free to play around with this core. I think this is a solid build for the beginners. I would say this is the one that is the simplest to play for me, but there is still a lot of math involved, and you still do have to be really calculating for outcomes. When you can move so many cards around on the final turns of the game, you have a lot of flexibility, and there are a lot of cards you can put in this list, and you, you have flexibility both in play style and in how you build the deck itself. As an example of the flexibility in how you build the deck itself, this is 11 of 12 cards that Owl God used to top 8 the Snap Battle Arena. He had a Sunspot in over the Iceman. I opted for the Iceman as just like a, a way to sort of freeze up those Shuri Nimrod decks. I didn't want to actually put armor in here. I wanted a one-cost card, and I really wanted to just have something, just some minor disruption in there. I wasn't really soaking with Sunspot a lot, and so I ended up on the Iceman instead. Just a good one-cost card that I can fire and forget. And the reason the one-cost cards I find are so important in a list like this is because both turn one and turn three are going to be turns where you can weave in a one-cost card very easily. You are very often playing a two-cost card on turn two and then a two-cost card on turn three. So you can go Craven into Silk plus Iceman, move the Silk, start getting Craven procs. That's a pretty big deal. Now, the reason we can't play Kitty Pride in this list is because of Magneto. Magneto is one of those cards that is being played in reaction to a lot of the Darkhawk lists. Because Darkhawk lists are composed almost entirely of 3 and 4 cost cards, Magneto controlling where they go is extremely powerful. Especially if you play him in a lane with Kraven already in it. 
Now, this list, I think, is actually even a little bit simpler to play than the other one, but I wouldn't necessarily call them the same deck. They use the same core to achieve different aims. This is a much more mid-range curve-out deck, while the other one is, I would genuinely describe it as a little more aggressive, a little more just trying to put stats on the board. This one does sort of similar things. Obviously, Black Bolt and Stature are very powerful, and it, it, it's a little bigger, though. The other deck, lower to the ground, less vulnerable to Shang-Chi. We actually run a Magneto, and that can die to Shang-Chi, right? There are big cards in here. Now, there is a little bit of tension between playing a Stature deck and playing a Magneto, but generally, that just sort of seems to work out whenever I play this. Like, we, we have turns that are like, instead of playing Magneto, it's Enchantress and Stature, stuff like that. It's not that bad. One thing that does stick out to me, though, is that there's no Shang-Chi in here, so do feel free to mess around with that Enchantress slot if that's what you really want. I was very impressed with Black Bolt Stature in this shell. It's possible that this sort of thing is just the new mid-range Darkhawk, if that makes any sense, right? It's just the shell that puts the most consistent points on the board, and Black Bolt Stature has always been a spectacular top end in those mid-range lists. I think right now Magneto is just a concession to where the meta is at, but at some point the top end might be Black Bolt Stature again. Next up is Thanos. I've got two Thanos builds for you today. The first is Thanos Lockjaw, courtesy of the Human Spider. Use this build to finish second in the most recent Snap Battle Arena, and it is a very, very powerful list in my estimation, but it is something that takes a lot of time to get used to playing, and it's not the most intuitive, but it is quite powerful. Again, you see the deck leaning on Magneto in order to deal with these Darkhawk lists, which increasingly are cutting Killmongers, meaning the Thanos stones stick. But even if they aren't cutting Killmongers, you see a death in here in order to get a lot of power on the board as payback for getting Killmonger. One of the other most crucial cards in this list, and I think probably the reason I like it, is wave. You would be very surprised just how many decks, even if it doesn't seem like it, do not like seeing wave on turn five. Even a Darkhawk deck relies usually pretty heavily on playing two cards on the final turn of the game. After all, the most important turn to have Zabu is turn two, but as long as you have Zabu in, in order to enable playing two fours on the final turn of the game, the Darkhawk deck is usually in a good spot. Wave takes that away, Magneto moves them all to a bad lane. It's a very, very compelling way of trying to swing a matchup that traditionally has been in favor of the Darkhawk deck. Next up is, I would argue, an even more complex and difficult deck to pilot. This is OKJK's Move Thanos deck that he used to finish first in the most recent Snap Battle Arena, beating THS, the Human Spider, in the finals with some really incredibly slick play. This is a deck that gets a lot of value from people just not knowing what's happening, but fundamentally, all that it is is just you put Thanos in the good cards move core. Like, we've already talked a lot about how good cards move is very, very close to, if not better than Darkhawk, at just being a points deck right now. And so this list manages to accomplish that in a Thanos shell while including some of its own tech. And the main advantage of Thanos is that the tech that this list includes is not necessarily something that it has to play. The way Darkhawk has this disadvantage into the move decks because, you know, Rogue, Enchantress, Shang-Chi are dead, a Thanos deck might not have that same disadvantage because they are drawing so many cards, because their hand is so full, because they have so many other options than just relying on the tech. And that is, I think, one of the big strengths of this list. Obviously, there's some built-in move synergy with Thanos and Soulstone. You obviously love having control over locations in your move deck because of Reality Stone. There's a lot of good things happening here that are only made better by the addition of Thanos. And this just strikes me as just a deck that was like, all right, we're just going to jam all the best cards into the same deck, and we're going to call it a day. And it definitely worked out for OKJK. OK I think right about here is where we move into what I would consider probably a lower tier of decks that are definitely worth highlighting as new and exciting, but not necessarily decks that I would be playing if I were tryharding. They're, they're good. By, by all means, go ahead. And this is one of them. I was really impressed by Mirage in this list. 
And I, I, I generally am someone who wants to be running three or so early drops. I tend towards wanting to play cards early. And the Mirage is just great because you play the Mirage on turn two, and then you usually get something that you can weave in on turn four or turn five, and it's just like a fine card. And a lot of the cards that people are playing right now, things like Spider-Ham, things like Jeff, like these are gonna be cards that you're really happy to see a pretty significant amount of the time. So I think this is a very solid list. Obviously, you know, Brood into Absorbing Man is extremely powerful. We're very rarely actually pulling off the full, you know, Sarah into Silver Surfer Absorbing Man, but it can happen. One other thing that I've seen in this these lists that I would be interested in including is uh, Magic, but right now there's just so much location control that I don't really want to deal with the card. So we've opted for the tech in the form of Rogue and Shadow King, and that is hopefully enough to keep a lot of those decks under control. But if you want to go for Magic, feel free. Another thing I've done is there's no Storm Juggernaut in here. I, I, I have found that I genuinely just don't want to be doing that a lot of the time. It's powerful, but we're really just going for stats here. This is a let's put out some stats and then our tech answers are Rogue and Shadow King. And we're just gonna we're just gonna go from there. So I, I think that is the approach I like to surfer right now. I don't necessarily think really any of the cards are required outside of like Brood, Absorbing Man, and of course Silver Surfer, but like a lot of flexibility exists in this archetype. I do not think we have found the best list of it yet. I think there is so much more left to explore, and I encourage you to do that exploration. Speaking of lists that I don't necessarily recommend, but like if you want to do it, go ahead. Discard is about as good as it ever has been. It's another one of those things where a lot of the time in the early metagame, you end up in a situation where discard is good because we kind of know what the good lists look like. And then as people figure out like, okay, actually good lists, suddenly discard starts falling off a cliff a little bit. But that is, you know, it's entirely possible that that happens here. But right now, one of the things I always like doing in week one is saying like, look, if you like discard, you can get your kicks here you can get whatever you want out of the discard archetype right now because it probably won't be good in a week. So good luck. There are two other decks that I think probably deserve to be on this list, but I personally haven't played, so I won't recommend them to you without having played them enough. But I think, interestingly enough, both of them are Sherry lists. The first is some form of Nimrod Destroy is very powerful. One thing you'll notice is a lot of these mid-range lists don't really have answers to that card, or at least they don't have consistent ones. Even if you have Cosmo, a Destroyer might get there in, in, a, in an off lane. So even if you Cosmo the Nimrod lane, it might not get there. Like Shuri Nimrod is just extremely, extremely powerful. And the ability to go over the top of all of these mid-range lists, that's kind of how those mid-range lists lose. The Wave ones, the Darkhawk ones, the Move ones. If you just go over the top, it, they, there's not a lot of answers in there. So Nimrod at 12 power after a Shuri, you can't Shang-Chi it, you can't do much about it. The Shadow King can get there maybe, I like, but there's not a lot of armor in the metagame right now, and there's not a lot of Cosmo even, despite it showing up in a couple of these lists. So that is, that is one of them. And the other one is, of course, Classic Shuri, but I do think Classic Shuri is a little reliant on like specifically getting its own armor. So the classic Shuri deck is like with Sauron, with Armor, Shuri, Red Skull, Taskmaster. But the way most of those decks are built, there's no real way to avoid getting Shang-Chi'd on turn five or on turn six on your turn five guy. You don't have a She-Hulk anymore. You're not really like banking that power. You don't have that anymore. You can't go like She-Hulk, Taskmaster, a lot of these lists because they're relying on Sauron and like Typhoid Mary and stuff. And it just makes them way more vulnerable to Shang-Chi and it just sort of feels like if they don't draw armor they're just like just heinously and ruthlessly dead a lot of the time but they exist and you should be prepared for them you can absolutely run into those and you should be aware that they are around it's another list where Shadow King will show some value I know Browde ran Shadow King instead of Rogue I believe in his Dark Hawk deck you can absolutely try that if you would like so that is my tier list for week one. As always, please remember, this is just my opinion. It's a pretty informed opinion. 
And if you think I missed something, leave it down in the comments below. I read every single one. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Keep an eye out for tomorrow when we will have an interview with the human spider breaking down his Thanos list that we talked about in this tier list. Thank you so much. I will see you in the next one.